Oi, oi. Hello and welcome to, this is a first time video for a Royal Ascot All My Bets. Obviously do this for Cheltenham and as much as I can throughout the season. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to crack on. So the reason why I probably haven't done this in the past is I don't have that many bets when it comes to the Royal Meeting. It will be similar this year, I suppose. You'll see that as we go through. I'm going to talk about every single one of the races just for the purpose of, as a bit of like value, I guess maybe value we'll see that it's debatable we'll see what the results are after but adds a little bit more to the video than just being talking about one or two bets for the day um but we'll go through that so make sure you're liking the video make sure you're subscribed to the channel drop a comment below with what you fancy especially on day one i'm also going to pull up a couple of things on the screen so i'll, I'll have the racing post up so you've got some visual see prices on there um i'll give you a quick run through the cheat sheets that i've done for gg so i'll put a link to those in the description they're banging because you can just save them on your phone which shows them in there so i'll pull that up we'll quickly skim through those um and then yeah i'll tell you what i've been betting on as well i've got an actual real paper slip here and then there'll be some bets i haven't quite struck yet that i will be doing now with it with the flat i do find that waiting for prices in some instances isn't necessarily a negative when you get to the top echelons the group one type races especially in competitive races I think there's people that want to take a few of them on. So I'm, I have struck one bet. Um, there's bets that will be coming. So I'll tell you those. I can't show you the slips. But I guess we can do at the end of the week a um, profit and loss type thing. Semi difficult to share it exactly, isn't it? Because I'm putting slips on and I could have 50 of these and then only share with you the winning ones, which I obviously wouldn't do that. The online stuff, I'll mostly just be using the exchange. So I can share what I'm doing on there. But that will be the main taste for me, probably of the five days of Royal Ascot. I'll try and do a bit of trade and actually to switzerland on saturday so i'll probably won't well i won't be betting on the um saturday but i'll let you guys know what i'm interested in and anyway we'll, we'll sort of crack on so let me pull the screen up so you can see i've got the racing post up on here so i'll just quickly skim as i say i'll put a link in the description for this so go give it a click because you know link clicks are always good aren't they but these are handy to an extent right and what i mean by to an extent i don't want to downplay the stuff that i've put in here but I've gone through and done the stats properly. So there is for each of the races more in depth stuff there, but I've given like a quick summary. So if you, like I said, if you wanted to grab your phone, save this image and your phone, so you've got it to like a little picture, just helps you whittle down the field a tiny bit. And with the whittling part of it, you also are probably going to help yourself with, if you've got a handful of selections, if everything is sort of ticking a couple of the boxes or, or not necessarily all of the boxes, then it may make you realise that it is more of an open race than it particularly looks. Of course, back in blind just off the back of trends and stuff is a risky process because every single horse, every single year that would tick boxes is a different profile type horse. And also there would be a lot of horses in certain races that would tick the boxes. So yeah, it gets a bit tricky to use these, but that, I, do, I genuinely do think they're quite handy, especially when you're looking at some of these handicaps and we're looking at draws and things like that as well so there will be something that will flick ourselves back and forth to what i'm showing the racing post so as i say it's an all my bets video where i'm telling you what i bet but i'm also going to try and give you a quick run through for each of the days of ascot because why not the sun is shining it's the middle of the week and we've got nothing better to do with our lives right so queen Anne stakes preferably you want a four-year-old who's won at ascot has an official rating of 116 plus has won a group one and has run within the last 31 days so when we look at those figures in there, well, Big Rock's the only one that ticks those boxes. He is the four-year-old. He has won at Ascot, and he did run more recently. But obviously, he was very, very, very disappointing. I was a big fan of this horse going into that last race. I thought, don't care about switch to train and all those types of things. I thought good horses, I don't know. I thought he'd better carry on. Like, I didn't think there would have been enough time for the trailer to have ruined him. But he's thrown the jockey under the bus, is not he? I don't believe it like I'm, it's once bitten twice shy type thing isn't it i don't really want to get involved with big rock he could look like a big prize outlier it depends what your levels of staking is like but sky bet are doing money back regardless of the results so if your horse just loses you get your money back you can see how tight they are on a lot of these but like their big rock for example you could back him um and if he doesn't win then get your money back but you could do that with any horse that's in here so i know a few people like maljum um charin i don't believe is it sounds really rude, but I don't think he's good enough. Um, I don't really think he is a Group 1 winner in waiting in this sphere, but it's a mixed bag of a race, right? They do the preview for GG, so anyone that's already watched that will have a bit of a feel of what I sort of, what way I view this race. But Factor Cheval, for me, we're looking at horses that are able to put up big, big numbers, and although it's 
it's just the one run that's in the like plus 120, which was last time out in Maidan. It's a good enough run, right? Those figures are it's suggested enough that it could potentially do it. Was a furlong further, but ground will be fine for this horse. I know typically with the horses that are in France, we talk about them probably needing bad ground and things like that, but he's, he's got real good form when it comes on quicker surface, even when there's been good ground over in France, which might even be a little bit quicker. He's been fine. And he's run a good like few high teens as well, like 119s, 117. So obviously in, in spiral coming out, makes us a bit more of an open race for some of those in behind big rock's going to be terrifying for the fact that he's a reasonable price for a horse that has got loads of ability has ticked the boxes for the trends piece um i just don't know whether you can believe what he's going to do obviously he was so bad last time as well but each way places up for grabs don't know if i'll be playing him like that i don't know i don't know what i'll be doing from his perspective but i do like factor cheval now because in spiral has come out the price on factor cheval as contracted in comparison to where I'd like him to be in, I'd have been happy for Inspiral to run in here because I'd have been happy to take her on. Obviously not in here. So I haven't struck a bet yet on Fatty Um 130 here. I think on the machine, she's a, uh, well, he's a bit bigger. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping I can get closer to closer to four to one on this horse. So I will back Fatty Cheval because I, I, I think the horse has got a, like a chance in here. It wouldn't be a strong, strong, strong fancy. So in the scheme of my bet any stuff, probably be something like it'd be 25 to 50 quid is what i'll stake on the horse depending on the price if it stays this sort of price like I, I will get big on the exchanges but if i can't get seven to two or bigger on the exchanges then i would probably just let it slide but um factor javel will be a bet in that first race smallish investment though again it's all relative but the reason i tell you exactly how much i'm staking is so you can sort of scale it up we'll touch on this a little bit more as well as we go through because there's been comments before about the varying size of my stakes and what I'm doing with bits, which is understandable and fair, but I'll document or tell you now why I, I do what I do. So second race is the uh, commentary stakes. This has got very little form to go by and very prominent horses in the market have form lines with whistle in the jacket. You can see Cal of the Country is favourite. I say it's weak, but it's not. The odds checker stuff you've got to be careful with because it's just setting in at the moment. So leave, leave those as they are. And then Camille Pizarro, would be Aidan O'Brien's horse. He's got a fantastic record in the race, been smashing it out. So anyway, we'll quickly skim to the, the trends. So we'll have no more than two runs. That's obvious because the type of race it is. We'll have won a race. We'll have run within the last 32 days and preferably has already raced at six furlongs. So again, when you look at the Whitney down on there, I think the majority of them would tip those boxes. But Coward in the County, right? A lot of this is just hinging on the fact of whether Whistling the Jacket is an absolute weapon. Looks like potentially is going to be, but potentially looks like it's five furlong horse. It's a listed winner last time out, wasn't it, Whistling the Jacket? This Carol of the County could be really good, right? But there's just not enough substance in there for me to be wanting to go, boom, I want to smash into it. There'll be a lot of people that'll be the other way around, though, right? You get five places up for grabs. Nine to two could be like a bit of a scummy each way, you bet, because the form could really stand up. So I see the case of that. The Camille Pizarro one was beaten last time out. Form lines again that run straight through that Whistling the Jacket. Arizona Bra Blaze was beaten, they beat it by a head last time out. Um, there's there's a tricky thing that I find in that race, though, right, is that Midnight Strike was in there for Joseph O'Brien. He's got a handle between where his horses are and, like, in comparison, Midnight Strike and this coward of the county. So it's, it's, it is what it is with those, right? He, he'll know where he is, but he's just not going to tell us, is he? So I can see why people would want to bet in this, but it is, from my perspective, more speculation than anything. This is what the difference with the flat is. You know, when we're thinking of like a Supreme Novice's Herd or something like that, we will have had a few runs in there. They should have battled against each other. You'll have a bit more of a bar of where they are. With this, when they've run once and they haven't faced off against this, obviously the same horses, hard to get a handle, but you could get a ready fire winner. So someone's more bullish than I am, then fair play to him. But the type of race I wouldn't want to get involved with, um, unless I'd visually seen something that I was like, oh my God, this is a worldie. And then I, I might be recommending a bet, but I wouldn't be in this particular instance. Um, King Charles Stakes group through uh, so the second group one, third race of the day. I've, this is where the slip comes in, right? So we'll pin out the trendy bits just for the sake of it. Has raced at Ascot ideally more than once. Has two or three runs this season, likely to be in the top three in the betting, but not necessarily the favourite. Ideally has an official rating of 117 plus. Now we don't have a vintage crop of five furlong sprinters, so we haven't got horses that are 117 plus. So as much as the trends, as I say, are in there, said in the last 10 were that good. This would just stress that it's maybe not a vintage renewal, but we'll see what happens after, right, and see how things go within there. Now, regional for me is a six furlong horse. Um, 
I know that everyone will say oh, it's a stiff six at Ascot, but look, they're watering a little bit, aren't they? It's good to firm ground. It, I, yeah, I, I don't like regional. Is, is the long and the short of it. I, I get it. I just don't. I don't think the regional's got a nine to twos chance in comparison to Big Ebbs. We'll come on to him a little bit more because I'm pretty sweet on him. They did run against each other in the Nun Fort, but I'm fully lined through in that for Big Ebbs. It was the first time that Zini had ridden him, last time that Zini's ridden him as well. And obviously he's come out and bounced out after on one race, whereas some of the horses in that race that finished in front of him have just continued to flop after. So if you've got a race where, I don't, it sounds mad to say it, but if you get a race where something really runs bad, and then everything else runs what you would class to normal form. And then afterwards, everything else doesn't seem to be as good as it looked in hindsight. And then the one that completely bombed actually looks better than it did before. We, you would just have to just put it down to a bit of an outlier race. So potentially reached in there, but who knows? Other horses that drop down in it, Believing's going to be one that's going to be very popular. Five furlongs, she beat Living the Dream last time, right? And I talked about some of the Gigi Weekend watch. The last time that um, she'd run at five furlongs, she just reared in the stalls and was just out of it. Now, the thing is, it's a group one form. I'm not 100% sure where we'd spit, we'd spit her, right? So only three quarters of a length behind regional, which I'm touching on is a six furlong horse. So you, you say that's a pretty good run at Haydock there. But I just don't know if we can fully trust that. And that would be a positive, I say a positive, but that would be a positive formula people would be using for fanciers of regional and fanciers of believing. And the main reason why I can't really trust that is we talk about these outlier performances. Shaquille and Sacred were both fancied horses in there. They finished 16th and 15th in that race. We haven't seen either of those since. So it's hard for me to trust that Group 1 being solid Group 1 form. Of course, won a listed race last time out, but wasn't really expected to do so. Um, and there's a listed win before that. Has won a Group 3. But I think form-wise believing is going to fall short of this one but obviously was quite good last time still be worried about that temperament a little bit now the one that i do really like and where the slip is i'll pull this one up is big ebbs i don't know if you can see it on note but it was zoom in but at 125 each way at four to one it does show nine to two on if william hill so i drove down there but it's four to one in the shop and <clears throat> i know i could possibly get a little bit more price on him like i might get the nine to two tomorrow i'm don't care i'm happy with big ebbs so i've had 125 each way People will be saying to me, why are you doing each way too much bomb out? I don't think that's the case. I think he's going to go have a proper, proper performance. If something does just do him, like a like little Big Bear vibes from last year where he got done, I just I feel like I've got enough security in there. And I think he should be a shorter price as well. So at the 125 each way, so 250 state will return 850. It will give me 225 back if he just places. So, you know, 90% of your money back. I feel that's the right way to play it. I'm comfortable with this. And again, from the staking stuff, people will be looking at the first one saying, well, you think I'm having 20 quid on that and now you've had 250 on this one. You, I have learned this from my profit and loss sheet that I'll look at and I will be sharing that at some point soon so you guys can use it if you want. But I've learned over a long period of time that just because on one day you've got a strong fancy and then a few smaller fancies, you don't need to bet in line with what you're doing that day. You need to bet in line with what you're looking at from the long term stuff. So if there's a dog that I fancy, I might have two, three, four, five hundred pounds on it. There might be another dog that I do fancy as well, but just not strongly that I might have 50 quid on. Over the course of the season, my bigger stakes bets, uh, you'd like to think that your bigger point performances would do better. But there's always in my mind going to be potentially, maybe hopefully, sort of 20 bets across the season could be high could be lower where you can get stuck into something and i feel like big Evs is that now spoken to a few of my flat friends they're not as bullish as i am they're probably not as keen one of them even thinks that he's just going to completely utterly bomb says he won't like ascot says that the race that he won last year the form's bad um so i'd like to get confidence from those types of things and i do back myself when it comes to the flat but i don't have as much confidence as i would do in the jump so I'm being bullish here. I'm putting a sizable stake on here. This would be, I'd say, different to when I'm saying, oh, this will definitely win Bolt and all that sort of stuff. You can see there's obviously some reservation in the fact that I bet the horse each way, but I do think the price is too big. I think he'll shorten up. They're saying they think he'll drift. So we'll have to just find out. But obviously, again, new viewers potentially watching this. I don't want you to think, oh, he's had 10 times the amount on this that he did in the first. I need to do that much as well. Bet within your own means, but also pick your own selections, right? Lots of you out there might not fancy Big Eves. Just because I've had a bit on him doesn't mean that you now need to change your opinion. But maybe go back, review some of his runs and see how you go with it. Now, on this, I do need to talk about Valiant Force because big, big, big price winner here last year, 150 to one poke, was just behind Big Eves last time out um and i think in these types of races right it's happened in the past we'll go back to millions of them feels like after time and but when we back two a permit four inch of hills went off at five to two i told you that the jam man was the danger 33 to one the jam man beat 
him into the race. Now, I think this horse, Valiant Force 16s, I'll get bigger on the machine, I know I will. I will have a small bit on Valiant Force. But who knows? It doesn't have to be much, maybe 10, 15 quid, something like that, because I think the form line is okay. Now, three-year-old form, they're saying, like Razor Post will say, is inconclusive, which is true. But five furlong horse, right? The first run was all right. And then the second run, first time under David Egan, with over six furlongs, I just ignore it. But I think that both those horses, right, when they ran that race in Santa Rini, it was on firm ground. I know they're watering a bit here, and it's a different type of beast, isn't it? But I do think that the ground will be fine for this horse. When you look back to when he ran behind Van Deek last year, that was on really bad ground. And that's only six furlongs a trip he doesn't want. And then you look at his five furlong form, that Malk, that's the, the horse that he beat here last year. People are talking about that horse in Group 1 company. I say people, Andrew's put him up for a bit of a price. And then even first time up, when he ran on soft, it was over five furlongs. Second to his majesty, I thought that was okay. He was a bit worked up that day as well. So I think Valiant Force has enough in there to suggest that 16 is a bit of an overprice. Yes, you potentially would be a little bit surprised if he was grade one worthy. But then really saying that, he's one a Group 2. Um, whereas some of these horses, I just don't think I'm as good as him. So I'll play, I've will play. i played Big E's, as we've seen there. Uh, big Evs, get told off for saying the name wrong. <laughs> and then Valiant Force, I'll have a small, I'll just do him on the bet fair because I'll get a price. Right, let's move on because as much as I'm happy to waffle and talk, we don't want to be here all day, do we, guys? Um, on the trends bit there as well, um, Believing is the horse that would be the one that said a couple of runs as well that would probably suggest that's got a, a nice chance in there. Just to palace that off. Palace that off? <laughs> just to finish that off. St. James Palace Stakes. Notable Speeds, Rosalie and Henry Longfellow. I can keep this one fairly concise, right? If we look at the trends for this particular race, will have already won this season. Has not run or won at Ascot. Likely to have two or three runs this season. Ran within the last 26 days. Likely to be priced four to one or shorter. So the market is saying that it's three horse race, really. The trends would tell you the similar similar part with that as well. And obviously with the running, not running an Ascot type thing, just because of the age they are and the types of races these horses might have gone for, they just might not have had an option as a, as a younger horse to come here. So again, slight pinch of salt, but it's just what's happened historically and it helps with the boxes. Now, Notable Speech could be an absolute weapon. Did have prep bronzo, didn't it, before the 2000 Guineas? I know it's his first one on turf, but I think a lot of people are not talking about that. Daryl's been saying that quite a lot. Daryl Carter from Betfair has been saying that that's sort of been forgotten a little bit. And a lot of people are saying, how's Rosalian going to reverse the form? Well, yeah, you'd have to question that because I don't think his Irish run was as good as his English 2000 Guineas run. But look, let's be honest. We have to be we have to be like frank that Notable Speech looks the most likely winner. Lots of people will want to steam into him at this sort of prize. Well, like they'll think of golf short, and who knows? The bookies might want to take him on tomorrow, or the people might. He might go a bigger price in the exchange. Don't know if it'll happen, to be honest with you. But I'm not interested in this. I'd rather watch the race, find out how good they are, see what the pecking order is. There's not enough juice in any of these prices. Look, if he was sat as a two to one poke, I would probably be saying I'm, I want to bet him because I think he's an obvious shortener. It may be the type of thing where I said I'll bet on a few races on the day. I'm sure I'll be able to find some in and outs with a lot of these. So, again, I can potentially share a video on that if you guys are interested on a day trade. And who knows? I might even go live for one of the days of Ascot if people are interested in that. And you can see as I'm betting real time. Henry Longfellow, I, I think the ground's gone against him massively i do really 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 like this horse but i couldn't bet him because of the ground but then that might not be enough of a reason to not bet him right good horses should go on anything so i just don't want to have an interest in the race in the slightest i'm looking forward to watching it but um as i say others may have stronger more bullish opinions than me in there right heritage handicap the uh ascot stakes now this is an interesting one right so before we go into drawy bits and stuff like that as well this is Andabad that is favorite for the race it has been touted by a few people out there I just remember this horse all the way through the jump season being touted to win every single race. People saying he's got loads of chances and he just wasn't wasn't winning. Um I'm just I'm very I'm just nervous about this horse being favourite, right? Like I feel like we've been here before with him being short. So this will be a race where if I was gonna have an interest, right? Again, I'll pull the trends up because draw and stuff is very important in this race. But Tritonic's five pounds lower than last year, and I think it's a weaker race. I think plenty of people would make the same case as well. I don't see what's wrong with betting him each way. Look, 16 to 1 top price, general 14s. But again, tomorrow the prices should go out. You can get six places with Betfair Paddy Power. You get seven places with Sky Bet if anyone could get on with them. But even at five places, I feel like he's a knocking each way bet for a small interest. So if I was to play Tritonic, which I might do, I'd be looking at, I know it sounds mad when you think about the 350, but like a 1250 each way or something like that. Like if I was going to have a bet, but I would probably sit that one out. But he's on the cusp of, of being a bet. We'll go look at the trends piece for this because. It is interesting. Likely to be age six. 
carrying between nine stone three and nine stone ten with two or more runs this season has run under national hunt rules this e this year uh preferably drawn stools one to seven or 17 to 19 so really really low or the extreme high so if we skim down for tritonic he's drawn six so where i said there you want to be drawn stools one to seven we look at tritonic he's a seven-year-old so that's a positive as well because the horses should be six plus shouldn't they we'll just double check with his with his this year running over national well he hasn't has he? he was chasing last season so i mean he's on the cusp sort of fall short on there Yar. Zandabad drawn four. That's probably why it's a positive as well. So, yeah, these sorts of things. Pipe Pipe has got a low draw as well, hasn't he? So it's one of them. Um, very much one of them. The right ones are drawn in the right places, I guess. But the market would agree with that sort of stuff. So, again, I don't want to waffle too much about this particular race. I'd have an interest in Tritonic. I don't think there's any reason to to be against him, I guess, um, given how already ran last year and he's £5 lower. Well, like I say, potentially a weaker race. There's always some sort of flying blot in here, isn't there? And I don't want to be jumping on the back of a market move to bet something. But who knows? Again, for me, this would be the dream race to be looking at potentially trading because I think lots of stuff will go up and down. There'll be market correction, but is what it is. Again, other people might have stronger opinions than me in there. This race here, the Wolverton Stakes, I do think this Isra should win. Listed race, four-year-old plus. We've got more form to go by. We've got more established ratings. We've got more RPRs to look at. And we've got more more of an idea about trip, ground, things like that as well. Now, Ishra, because it's a listed race, there are penalties that dot about, but it's the highest rated horse. Gets in here in a position where if it were running a handicap, he's better off with a load of these horses. Um, looks relatively solid, to be fair. And 72 about him again. I'm sure people would want to bet and get stuck into this horse. It's a drop in class as well for him, which is you, you, you have to look as a positive. But I do get worried sometimes when these horses have been falling short and then dropping down into a, like a lighter grade. They should be, you would think, winning the race. But then I start to question maybe attitude and things like that as well. But look, we look his last couple of runs behind Passenger, misses Ascot this week, but looked real good. Chester, um, Oki Joby was behind that horse as well. But again, both times sent off favourite. Both times those RPRs will be good enough to win this. Blinkers are on. Blinkers seem to be hopefully potentially doing a bit. But it's been a while, right, since he beat Adair back in 2023, so last year. Um, and that was over one mile four rather than this one mile two. So, yeah, I don't I don't know. Like, I, I do think he is the most likely winner of the race. I don't know if I just don't think I could bet him. I just, it's mad. I know it sounds stupid, but he's run at Ascot before. He's been beat at Ascot. But let's. Let's see what the trend would suggest, whether I'm being stupid. So, win a race this season, aged four or five, prefer preferably with an official rating of 106 plus, loads of that. Minimum of 102, again, probably all of that. Unlikely to be in the first two in the betting. That's when it starts to get a bit of a concern, right? There's a reason why he's not running in group races, because he's not fulfilling his potential. So, while we know they've got it in the locker, is he going to unleash it on the day? They would be my reservations about a horse like him, but I would fully expect him to win. So if you were looking to have a few bets on the day, then, you know, he might be one. You might want to stick in a lucky 15 or something. I won't be playing. Again, we'll look what happens on the exchange. If he goes up to a stupid price, I probably would bet, but yeah, you don't really want to be betting a drifter on the flat, do you? Right. Putting ourselves up into the last race, the Copper Horse Handicap. Now, good friend of ours, I mean, he's been on the show before, George, mate, put me onto a horse in this Fairbanks, who's balloted out. So basically that means that they wanted to run the horse, but because it's got a maximum field of 16, he didn't make it in. Didn't make it into the reserves either. So no I'm done on the anti-post betting. You get your money back of horses are balloted out. But yeah, I've, I've sort of lost a little bit of love for the uh, race of the back of that. Now, look, Bellocchio won this race last year. My mate Mozzie I always thought was like a good ground horse because they class him as a summy horse. But you need to remember with him as well, he actually doesn't want fast ground. He was just a summer horse beating summer horses um, as a kid. So as a kid, as a novice hurdler, when people talk about him for Supreme, but he's maybe that like a summer horse. So this is the time of year for him. I think he's pretty short, to be honest with you. It's a hard race. Um, I wouldn't have a massive opinion in this, and I do feel that there are better opportunities as the week goes on. So I, at, the, at this point, I don't have a strong opinion in the race. Again, there will be other people out there that do. Market support would be interesting. Um, I just I don't want to be betting like that this week. There's there's good five days worth of race, and I think there's a good few bets across the week. So I'm going to try and stick with what I should do according to my profit and loss, and I'm just going to get into the ones that I should get into and then hope that Lady Luck is on our side. So 
I'm going to wrap that up there. As I say, make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Drop a comment below with what you fancy the most. Again, I'll put a link to the description in the description to the cheat sheets. Please go click that because that helps out. It is handy to have to one side. You've got day two, three, four, five on there as well if you want to go have like an advanced look. Um, I'll be back tomorrow to uh, share my day two bets. Um, and obviously tomorrow would be day one. Who knows? I might actually go live tomorrow, seeing about trading and watching the races together to see if anyone's interested. If you are possibly interested and you stayed this far through the video, then drop that in the comments and let me know if you'd be interested in a bit of a live because I can show you how I trade on the day as well. And we can see firsthand whether I do my spuds or not. Anyway, thank you very much for your support. Have great days. Have real good weeks across Royal Alaska. I'll be back to do this for every single day of the week. I don't know how many bets I'll have. It won't be the same as Cheltenham where I'm getting stuck into every race. I have a real strong opinion in all of them, but I'm just going to be honest, right? I'm going to tell you where I bet why I've bet them, where I fancy in other races, why I've not bet them, or how much I'm staking, and obviously take it how you want, right? You don't have to follow me in. You don't have to do any of this stuff. I just like to share it because I think I know a bit about what I'm talking about. Flat, I guess a lot of you will know me from the jumps. Flat, I guess, for everyone is probably sort of um, inconclusive. It's been a tricky time for a lot of people. This isn't, this isn't me making excuses, but I've seen a lot of people, especially through the month of May, um, making losses and it is what it is right it's invariably part of it but this is where it's important i think to just get a feel of what the general people are doing so sounds a bit like shitty to say it probably but if there's certain people out there so like hugh taylor would be the typical one wouldn't he just year after year profit got it shared on at the races obviously people say they can't get in its prices so that's where it doesn't help joe public but obviously he knows what he's doing when I, the only reason i brought him up is he had a bad may as well so when you're I don't know, struggling with anything like that. It's nice to see that the people around you that you respect, etc., cetera, are in the similar light, right? Just bad luck, near misses, all that sort of stuff with the jockeys. That's why I've always been a bit tentative with the flat because a lot does come down to luck as far as I'm concerned. But look, I feel relatively confident. Um, we'll see how this week goes <clears throat> and then we'll see how confident I am for next year. Anyway, be lucky. Thank you for your support. And I will speak to you again tomorrow.